we begin with those new and alarming developments coming out of North Korea. New satellite images suggest North Korea could be preparing to revive its missile testing just over a week after that Hanoi summit failed to produce a deal. These images, taken days before the summit but just released publicly on Friday, show vehicles, cranes and rail cars near a facility outside Pyongyang where North Korea has previously assembled some of its intercontinental ballistic missiles, leading some experts to believe North Korea is preparing to launch what would be its first missile or rocket in over a year. Those images come just days after another satellite image emerged, showing cranes and supplies appearing to be used to rebuild another launch site in North Korea. Despite these warning signs, on Friday, President Trump appeared confident in his relationship with Kim Jong-un. Time will tell, but I have a feeling that our relationship with North Korea, Kim Jong-un and myself, Chairman Kim, I think it's a very good one. I think it remains good. I would be uh, surprised in a negative way if he did anything that was uh, not per our understanding. So what to make of North Korea's latest moves and was anything gained in those face-to-face -face meetings with Kim Jong-un? For more, let's bring in our headliner, the president's national security advisor, John Bolton. Always good to see you, Ambassador Bolton. So let's get right to it. Do you believe that North Korea is about to launch a rocket, a missile, a satellite? Well, I'd rather not get into the specifics on that. What you've just shown is commercial satellite imagery, to be sure. Uh, the United States government, I'll just put it this way, expends a lot of resources and effort so we don't have to rely on commercial satellite imagery. Uh, we've seen a lot uh, in North Korea. We watch it constantly. I've been doing this since the first Bush administration, George H.W. Bush. Uh, there's a lot of activity all the time in North Korea, but I'm not going to speculate on what that particular commercial satellite picture shows. What, what can you tell us? Do, are there railway, railroad cars, railway cars? Are there cranes? And, and, and could you give us, you've been doing this for years, give us some idea whether that concerns you. Well, look, uh, the president has been very clear that he's not going to make the mistakes of prior administrations. Uh, and one mistake that prior administrations made repeatedly was assuming that the North Koreans would automatically comply uh, when they undertake obligations. The North Koreans, for example, have pledged to give up their nuclear weapons program at least five separate times, beginning in 1992 with the joint North-South denuclearization agreement. They, they never seem to get around to it, though. So uh, that's one reason why we pay particular attention to what North Korea is doing all the time. We see exactly what they're doing now. Uh, we see it unblinkingly. Uh, and we don't have any illusions about what their capabilities are. Uh, let me just read you a quote. When you put all that together from those satellite images, that's really what it looks like when the North Koreans are in the process of building a rocket. That's Jeffrey Lewis, director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Project. Do you disagree with him? He's an expert. Yeah. Well, as I say, I don't really want to get into speculation about what they're doing. The particular site in question uh, has two facilities. There's one that uh, Kim Jong-un had told us earlier that he would dismantle. This is the so static hard. engine test site. Uh, there's also a launch site there that he promised to give up uh, to uh, Moon Jae-in, the president of South Korea. So it's actually two different parts of the same facility. And, and what would the consequences be if we saw another test launch? Well, as the president said, he'd be pretty disappointed if uh, Kim Jong-un uh, went ahead and did something like that. The president said repeatedly that uh, he feels the absence of nuclear tests, the absence of ballistic missile launches is a positive sign. Uh, and he's, he's used that really as part of his effort to persuade Kim Jong-un that he has to go for what the president called the big deal, complete denuclearization. L let's listen to what the president said at his press conference in Vietnam right after negotiations broke down. There's no more testing. And one of the things, importantly, that Chairman Kim promised me last night is regardless, he's not going to do testing of rockets and uh, nuclear, not going to do testing. So, you know, I trust him and uh, I take him at his word. I hope that's true. The president said he would be surprised if Kim did anything that was not per our understanding. Would you be surprised? Uh, you know, nothing in the prolifer prol proliferation game surprises me anymore. I think Kim Jong-un has a very clear idea 
uh, where the president stands, what the objectives the president's trying to achieve are. It's, it's why the decision uh, to walk away in a friendly way, as the president put it, from uh, the Hanoi summit was important for Kim Jong-un under, to understand the president, uh, despite what a lot of the experts and pundits say, is not under pressure to make any deal. Uh, he wants to make the right deal, and he described it to Kim Jong-un at the, the Hanoi meeting. Have you asked the North Koreans about these images? Has there been contact really since the Hanoi summit? Uh, I'm not aware of any. It's possible the South Koreans have, uh, have spoken to North Korea. I'm actually tomorrow morning going to be speaking with my South Korean ca counterpart, and I suspect this will be one of the things we discuss. And, and I want to play something else the president said at the summit in Hanoi about North Korea, which goes to something you were saying as well. We know the country very well, believe it or not. We know every inch of that country. The images at the launch site were from February 22nd, those commercial satellite images. Were you aware of them when you went to Hanoi? And was that something you brought up with the North Koreans? Well, again, that would get, uh, get me involved in discussing uh, intelligence, and I'd rather not do that. Uh, I'll just say we, we look uh, every day uh, at the intelligence that's provided to us. It's very important that we know as much as we can about the North Koreans. Uh, against the possibility that they might agree to the president's proposal, we'd need to be in a position to verify their compliance with it. So this is part of getting ready for that. Uh, and in any event, we want to track the potential for uh, a threat if, uh, if that emerges as well. And, and you talk about the president and the president saying he would be disappointed if there was a launch. That might be putting it mildly. Would this scuttle negotiations? Well, I'd rather not speculate on that either. As you heard, the president's confident in his personal relationship with Kim Jong-un. He's invested a lot of time in uh, trying to develop that relationship. Uh, he said he's open to a third summit. None has been scheduled, and uh, some time may have to go by. But he's prepared to engage again because he does think that the prospects for North Korea, which he's been trying to persuade Kim Jong-un to accept if they denuclearized, are really quite, uh, quite spectacular. Okay, let, let's backtrack a bit. At, at the Singapore summit, North Korea committed only to, quote, work towards complete denuclearization of the Korean peninsula. How do you define that? How do they define that? Well, uh, again, they have committed to denuclearization in a variety of forms several times in writing, solemn international agreements that they have happily violated. Uh, we define denuclearization as meaning the elimination of their nuclear weapons program, their uranium enrichment capability, their plutonium reprocessing capability. Uh, from the beginning, uh, we've also included chemical and biological weapons in the elimination of their weapons of mass destruction. This is important to us. Uh, because of our deployed forces in South Korea. It's important to South Korea and Japan. And, of course, we want their ballistic missile program ended as well. But they that didn't is, sign on to that. They, well, they have signed on to elements of that in uh, the 1992 Joint North-South Denuclearization Agreement. And we've made it clear the president handed Kim Jong-un a piece of paper, actually two pieces of paper, one in English, one in Korean, that uh, laid it out. And, and that said, all of what you just said and more, can you tell us exactly what that said? And, and who wrote that? Well, I can't tell you in Korean, but uh, it was... It Try was, with the English. Was, we'll, we'll settle for the English. I think I just did. Uh, you know, it was, it, It's just that. That's exactly what was said in that piece of paper? I, I'm not going to tell you it was word for word, and I don't have the piece of paper in front of me to check it, but that's in substance what it said. And who authored that proposal? It was written at the staff level and cleared around, as usual. And, and, and Steve Began, the special envoy to North Korea, said in a speech in January that he hoped the two sides could move simultaneously and in parallel through a roadmap of concrete deliverables. That sounds like step by step, you do something, we do something. Is that how you see it? Look, the, the president, as I mentioned before, is determined to avoid the mistakes prior presidents have made. And one of those mistakes is falling for the North Korean action for action ploy. Uh, and the reason that that doesn't work is that what North Korea needs, and it needs it very much right now, is economic relief. Uh, I think it's very much on Kim Jong-un's mind. He wants the economic sanctions released. And to get that, uh, he's prepared to give up some part of his nuclear program, perhaps uh, at a declaratory level, even a substantial part. But the marginal benefit to North Korea of economic relief is far greater than the marginal benefit to us of partial denuclearization. So that's why action for action, almost inevitably, in the past three administrations, 
uh, has worked to North Korea's benefit. And as I say, over a 25 plus year period, they never seem to get to denuclearization. Isn't that interesting? But but you also talk about strategic patience. The president said he that era was over. And yet just the other day, he said a year. Ask me in a year. You really give him a year? You, you yourself have said that time is on the side of the proliferator. Time. Uh, the historical lesson is time is inevitably on the side of the proliferator in the long run. Right now, I think it's the president's judgment. And I think it's correct that the economic leverage that we have because of the sanctions puts the pressure on North Korea. And that's one reason why all of the pundits and all the experts predicting a deal in, in Hanoi were wrong, because the leverage is on our side right now, not on North Korea's. And, and I want to turn now to Syria and ISIS. President Trump said that 100 percent of the ISIS caliphate in Syria has been defeated. But let me play what CENTCOM Commander General Votel said in his testimony before the House Armed Services Committee on Thursday. The fight against ISIS and violent extremism is far from over. What we are seeing now is not the surrender of ISIS as an organization, but a calculated decision to preserve the safety of their families and preservation of their capabilities and waiting for the right time to resurge. Do you agree with that assessment? I know it's very different, the caliphate and, and the ideological feelings about ISIS. Yeah, I don't know what the rest of uh, General Votel's statement said, so I don't want to criticize a partial clip. It has happened to me before that, uh, that a clip of four words or even a full sentence gets put on television and it doesn't convey the full sense of what I was trying to say. The president has been, I think, as clear as clear can be when he talks about the defeat of the ISIS territorial caliphate. He has never said that the elimination of the territorial caliphate means the end of ISIS in toto. We, we know that's not the case. We know right now that there are ISIS fighters scattered still around uh, Syria and Iraq and that ISIS itself uh, is growing in other parts of the world. The ISIS threat will remain. But one reason that the president has committed to keeping an American presence in Iraq and a, and a small uh, part of an observer force in Syria uh, is against the possibility that there would be a real resurgence of ISIS. And we would then have the ability uh, to deal with that if that arose. So I think people have to be clear. And, and the importance of the territorial caliphate goes to an ideological point at the center of ISIS's theory of itself, namely that they were a caliphate because under their view of what a caliphate is, it's you have to control territory. territory. And, and, and actually, I wasn't trying to argue that. I was trying to ask whether you believed a resurgence Surgence could happen, how serious that is. I know we've asked for help from the allies there. Have you got any firm commitments from allies to help out? Yeah, well, certainly in conversations this past week with my British and French uh, counterparts, uh, very optimistic that they're going to participate. It hasn't uh, happened formally yet, but, uh, but they're looking at it. I think it's very important that we try and get this up. It may or may not succeed. But uh, General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has worked extensively on this. He's had considerable success. We're still pursuing it. The ISIS threat, the al-Qaeda threat, the terrorist threat is an ideological threat worldwide. And it's something that I think we have to be vigilant against uh, for the foreseeable future. And, and, and that is reality. also something over the years we just don't really know how to approach the ideological threat. Do, have you made progress in that? Do you believe you're where you want to be? Well, I think uh, as long as the ideology is out there, it continues to be a threat. And uh, there are different circumstances in different parts of the world. But for those who have said, for example, the, the, the terrorist threat from Iran, those who have said uh, in, in the uh, years since the 1979 Islamic Revolution, 40 years now, the ideology will fade. They'll just become normal nation again like everybody else. That hasn't been true in Iran. They're still in the grip of a radical uh, theology, and, and ISIS and al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups show no sign of that ideology abating. And, and I want to turn now to Venezuela. We've seen the mass demonstrations um, trying to halt food aid into the country. Nicolas Maduro looks like he is not really going anywhere. ABC's Tom Yamas talked to Venezuelan President Maduro a few weeks ago, who said he fears President Trump because of those around him, including you. Let's listen. Do you fear President Trump? Yo le temo a los que lo rodean, a John Bolton, un extremista experto de la Guerra Fría, a Elio Abrams, un mentiroso con Tomás que traficó con armas, drogas en Centroamérica, en el mundo y llevó a la guerra a los Estados Unidos. Yo creo que esta gente rodea muy mal al presidente Trump sobre los temas de Venezuela. I think you got the idea there, pointing the finger right at you and others. Do you want Maduro to fear the advice you're giving to the president? 
Uh, let me just say, I'm honored to be named by Nicolas Maduro. I add him to the list of other people who have uh, criticized me over the years. Uh, I don't wish him any ill will. I tweeted some weeks ago, I hope his future uh, consists of living on a nice beach somewhere far from Venezuela. Uh, it's not just Maduro, though. It's the entire regime. It's a group of kleptocrats who have plundered Venezuela of its oil wealth, uh, have impoverished the people. You can see that now with the collapse of their uh, nationwide uh, electrical but grid. But do you think Maduro's going anywhere? It's been about six weeks since the U.S. backed I think, Guaido. Look, I, I think momentum is on Guaido's side. Uh, reports in the press that uh, stress the military hasn't shifted miss the point entirely. Uh, What's the point? The point is that they have not st uh, sought to arrest Guaido and the National Assembly and the opposition. And I think one reason for that is that Maduro fears if he gave that order, it would not be obeyed. The fact is, and, and the media don't know it because people don't talk about this, there are countless conversations going on between members of the National Assembly and members of the military in Venezuela talking about what might come, how they might move to support the opposition. They're so not you're pretty certain that. Maduro's going to be out? Well, I'm not certain of anything. But I do think uh, momentum is on the side of Guaido. I think the overwhelming support of the population and the overwhelming support of the enlisted personnel in the military and the junior officers, the, the top officer corps, uh, only a few have broken. You know, there are 2,000 admirals and generals in Venezuela, which is more than all of the nations of NATO combined. That tells you who benefits from plundering the economy. But uh, many of them are talking as well. We'll see what happens. Okay, thanks very much, Ambassador Bolton. We'll end on that note. It's always great to have you here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.